Uh, hello and welcome to chapter four in Anderson's Environmental Economics and this chapter is the role of government. <clears throat> and we have a picture here of a bike lane and the question is this is kind of a free rider problem and without government who would provide the bike lanes and roads? Now Anderson has a very interesting introduction to this in which he's talking about uh, government and the uh, and the role of it and he says that the movies portray government like romance as being either idyllic or disastrous and as he goes on further to say in life um, things are a lot more complicated sometimes government is good um, sometimes oftentimes it messes with the role with the role of the private market. You know, private market does a very, very good job of um, allocating uh, scarce goods to those who are willing to buy them. And if a good becomes more scarce, the, the price goes up. And if a good becomes less scarce, the price goes down. Um, <clears throat> now, when markets are, are inefficient or when there's some goods that have no formal markets, government can uh, play a role to do a better allocation of those things that are scarce. Now, um, <clears throat> government can be can be good if um, if human beings are are as such to um, to provide for it and to um, and to believe in it <clears throat> and be passionate about it. Uh, but then government can also be um, be the agent of the, of many of the ills that humanity uh, imposes upon each upon themselves. Um, you know this was this was done shown in Nazi Germany, Stalin's government, Eastern European nations during the 1990s, and several African nations. So, you know, government can be the best of times, and government unfortunately can be the worst of times. Um, but government does have a does have a role, and as the previous chapter shows, government does have a role in the economy because markets oftentimes can fail to provide what society wants. All right, and here is a view of our nation's capital, the um, the Capitol Rotunda, where our houses of of uh, Congress meet. Now, the meaning and purpose of government. So, what is government? <clears throat> and as your book describes it, um, uh, government is a body um, is a body with the authority to govern. Very, very simple. And you know, government is is the is the agency that um, that pro that provides um, services that otherwise could not be provided. By the private sector. That's how we describe it in uh, in economics. Now you have here some different types of government that your book describes, and I'll just go through them one by one. Although you certainly can um, can read up on this in the book. We have first an uh, autocracy, which is one individual with unlimited power. Uh, there's dictatorships um, all around the world, Iraq and Pakistan. Um, one type of another, another type of um, government kind of associated with this would be a theocracy, which is a government run by priests or clergy. And your book gives an example of Iran as it, um, like that. Um, many um, Saudi Arabia can be like that as well. A monarchy. <clears throat> Is ruled by uh, royalty, king, queen, emperor, or empress, and um, you know Japan as an example, England as an example. But those those uh, individuals have don't have real constitutional power. They're they're very much democracies, and uh, but but the. But the rulers are are still are still there as almost almost kind of a figurehead and a figurehead that the that people the the people really really uh, want to have for um, 
for a sense of consistency and, st and stability of the um, of the country. What else do we have here? We have communism. <clears throat> You know, it's a system designed to eliminate material inequities between via collective ownership of property. Um, so in communism, I think the main thing there is that there is no uh, private property per se, which goes very, very much against uh, what it, what proponents of capitalism believe. And your book will go into your chapter will go into a little bit as well about the role of private property. And how, and how it can alleviate environmental harm. We have socialism here. <clears throat> it shares with communism the goal of fair distribution. Um, however, instead of the wages being controlled by the government, under a socialist system, wages are determined by negotiations between trade unions and management. And a single political party does not rule the economy. So... <clears throat> There's a goal of equity, but there's also probably some degree of private property as well. And many, many countries in Europe, in addition to Canada, have semi-socialist systems. Uh, let's see, we have pluralism. Uh, government decisions are based upon negotiations upon um, leaders of business, government, labor groups, and others. Imperialism, a policy of expansion and domination of a nation's authority. And we have two categories here, classical liberalism and modern liberalism. Uh, classical liberalism, what a lot, a lot of people haven't heard of, it dates back to the, um, to the days of Adam Smith. Um, and so political philosophy espousing freedom from church and state authority, heavy emphasis on pre, free enterprise economics and individual freedom. So... <clears throat> Classical liberalism, you might think of uh, libertarians as proponents of classical liberalism. Now, modern liberalism <clears throat> is liberal, but it's um, they would advocate maybe more socialism and more government involvement, uh, but probably less emphasis on um, on the state control of. Um, of social morals and, be, and behavior. I would think Holland, um, Netherlands might be a good example of this. And finally, we have capitalism. Uh, private individuals own land and businesses and operate them in the pursuit of profit. And democracy um, is governed by the people or their elected representatives. Now, we in the United States def uh, and most many countries have a mixed economy, uh, a whole lot of capitalism, and some modern liberalism, but democracy kind of kind of um, holds it holds it all its way. So many many uh, countries have a, uh, <clears throat> a bit of mixture, although there certainly are some that are autocratic and monarchy. Um, but there's very few that are true communist countries. I would think probably the only two uh, that are left are North Korea and Cuba. Okay. Here we go for slide three. Is government necessary? And oh my, there's lots of disagreement on this one. <clears throat> uh, and I spent some time in my um, in my micro and macro classes about um, the role of government. Suffice it to say um, that if in the United States, at least, if you are, uh, shall we say, more conservative or more Republican, you're less likely to see government as the um, as the solution. More likely, you're see, to see it as the problem. Whereas, if you're more liberal and democratic, you mean you would see the private markets as more of the problem and government more as the solution. Now, conservatives' view of government as environmental steward. They express concern about government's efficiency as the role and the role of environmental steward. And it does not mark a failure that leads to pollution, but government failure to recognize property rights and to hold polluters fully liable for their activities. So conservatives feel that, that government should enforce private property rights and privatize whenever possible, and there would be less incentive to pollute if, um, if most land or all land was privately held. 
Now, what factors can influence the need for government in for provide um, environmental protection? Well, your book lists a number of things: um, <clears throat> population density, religious and social culture, education, wealth, and wealth, degree of industrialization, and sensitivity of the environment of the existing ecosystem. So. So there, there are many things that um, would bring into um, bring into the fray government for for ill and not for the issue of environmental uh, protection. I think a big thing would be population uh, density. So um, you know, government would be would be called. There's more. There's more population, um, and there's there's impacts of one individual upon uh, or or population upon the environment. So there's more in there. There's more call for that third party, that government. Whoops. Back, back, back. Oh, shoot. My bad here. And um, your book has some interesting insights on the role of education and wealth. Um, and I'll have you um, uh, read a, read about that. Um, you know, ed education, education, and and education. Um, let's see what they have to say here. Um, you know, uh, through education and leaders, government can help foster the type of moral climate that makes its role as forceful defender less necessary. So, you know, uh, the more educated people are, maybe the less need there is for government as the entity. To enforce the um, the need for environmental protection, wealth as well. Um, it may it may be that as uh, that as folks become mo become wealthier, um, there may be less need for the government because people would protect the environment in and of themselves. We'll have more discussion about the role of wealth in particular uh, in f in future chapters. Okay, now we have a uh, role of government. Um, is it a is uh, bit part, supporting actor, or the lead? And uh, this section is on historical ideologies. And there's, a, there's a, some chatter about classical li um, liberals versus classical conservatives. I talked a little bit th about this in the previous slide. I'll just quote from the chapter. Um, Advocates of a laissez-faire or free market approach have long trumpeted the virtues of a market unfettered by government intervention, especially in the United States. In the world, in the words of Thomas Jefferson, that government is best that governs least. A contemporary of uh, Jefferson's and a, a fellow classical liberal, Adam Smith, thought that a free market driven, driven by the actions of self-interested individuals would regulate and correct itself. So now that is in contrast to classical conservatives who felt that liberals fate placed too much faith in human rationality. They argued that people are prone to bouts of unreasonable behavior and irrational passions and immorality. The classical conservatives favored adherence to the institutions of government and the church, as well as to societal traditions and standards in order to Avoid the chaotic results of freewheeling human impulses. So, this this was definitely a, a major uh, philosophical battle in the um, in the eighteenth century, and to some extent, it continues today. Now, in the nineteenth century, things be, things got uh, things got interesting because of industrialization, and. Um, and, and that led to great inequalities among, uh, amongst people. A few individuals um, got a lot of the wealth, not unlike today. And that led to the U.S. government becoming quite a bit more involved in the, um, uh, in the fray with uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, get, getting involved, the progressive movement. And so the government played a much bigger role because of the inequities caused by industrialization in the 19th century. 
Okay, and then I'm going to end things right here for the first section.